I've spoken to someone from the Wall Street Journal about China, and he said that China has this issue of potentially growing old before growing rich. Mm-hmm. Is there is there hope for the Chinese economy that it's so strong, growing so fast, that it can absorb this aging population? Or how does how do those things look to you? I, I don't think so. So there's this whole literature on the so-called middle income trap, mm-hmm. and I actually think it's almost impossible for China to avoid that. Um, and because it's not just that the population is is aging, it has a lot to do with the um, severe underinvestment in education for a big part of China's population. So basically, you know, that first of all, let me just explain. Like the idea of the middle income trap is just that poor countries they can grow fast initially, but they tend to get stuck at about $10,000 per year per person or, or less, so sort of middle income status, because you can grow fast initially because there's all this low hanging fruit. There's easy fixes you can make in your economy. You can move peasants into factories. That makes them much more productive. You can build roads that suddenly open up new areas of economic development. Uh, your wages are typically low, which makes your exports very cost competitive. But then as you enter this middle income status, all those low hanging fruit have been picked. And so growth will start to slow unless you can figure out a way to now start educating factory workers to become office workers and entrepreneurs. And you know now that you've paved the roads, you, you need to find ways to innovate. And I think China could, could get stuck here just because um, it, you know, the, the only countries that have blasted through this middle income trap had highly educated populations. They had, you know, 75% or so of their population with a high school degree. China today, only 30% of its current workforce has gone to high school, and that's dead last mm-hmm. among middle income countries. And, you know, I think Westerners just aren't aware of this problem because it's taking place largely outside the big cities where most Westerners never travel. But, you know, 70 percent of China's children today are in rural areas. And in those areas, it's, it's a completely different China than the one that most people are used to seeing. The, the, out there, people live on less than ten dollars a day. Education and healthcare are abysmal. And there's been major studies that have come out recently showing that roughly half of these children in rural areas are undernourished. A third of them have IQs under 90, which means it's going to be very difficult for them to do even basic like middle school math. Um, they have worms in their stomach. So they, you know, they struggle to learn. They fall behind and they're essentially unemployable in a modern economy. And that wasn't a problem 20 years ago when there was lots of construction jobs and factory jobs. But now that all those roads have been built and and factories are starting to move to places like Vietnam where labor costs are lower, um, there just aren't as many jobs. And, and, these, and there's been studies, um, particularly these ones by um, a research team at Stanford that estimates there may be 200 to 300 million unemployable workers entering China's economy in the coming years. And many of them are going to be men because of the one child Mm. policy. Families aborted baby girls. So you've got 40 million extra men that will never marry. Many of them may be unemployable. And so we don't really know how this is going to play out, but it doesn't bode well for China entering and and continue to advance and blast through these demographic problems. I mean, we've seen in Mexico and Brazil where they had much smaller sort of versions of this this problem and the result was a surge in crime and violence because these undereducated men, you know, they say, well, I'm not just going to wash windows on the side of the street. I'm going to find other ways to earn. And um, it tends to be very bad for the social fabric of the nation, as well as obviously the productivity of the economy. Yeah, I was speaking with someone just yesterday who's a a historian who's talking about how cultures that have lots of men or even uh, pioneering organizations that have lots of men and then they, they say, well, there, if there's no women, there's no biological future for us. Mm-hmm. And then they, they tend to lash out, attack others and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, some people say China is likely to be not so aggressive because of the one child policy, because you have so many families that only have one child, they don't want to risk them. And that's somehow going to pressure the regime to, I don't know, back off Taiwan. I, I worry that you could have an opposite situation where the regime's like, we have 40 million men who have no prospect of getting married. I actually think this is part of the impetus behind the Belt and Road Initiative, where they sent lots of men to go work abroad and build infrastructure because they were gainfully employed and out of the country. Mm. But you could imagine in a military scenario, the regime may be less casualty averse because they view these men as essentially surplus and potential sources of instability. So, you know, they're more likely to be willing to throw them into a meat grinder um, and and uh, take risks that way. So I, I'm not sure how that can play out, but I worry very much about just this, the sex imbalance on top of the demographic pressures on the regime. Mm-hmm. And Michael, you talked about the population being undereducated, much of it. This comes as a surprise, I think, to most Westerners, particularly Americans, when we see 
so many very talented Chinese students in our universities and things like that. Um, what do you think? What else do you think could could make for that perception, or is it is it really just a myth? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think it because China has invested heavily at, at the highest end of education. So they've okay. built like, you know, their version of the Ivy League where they've really propped up the big name universities, you know, Beida, uh, Tsinghua, um, and, and they've made them, you know, world class universities. And they also have heavily funded science and engineering research and development. So they have more scientists and engineers technically, according to their definition of what meets those criteria than any other country in the world. And then you just have the fact that, you know, most Westerners, um, even, uh, you know, a lot of people with a platform like journalists or, or scholars who are writing about China, they spend most, you know, you fly in through the world-class, you know, airport in Beijing, you go to the five-star hotel, you know, you go to the banquet and meet with a bunch of elites, um, you know, and, and they tell you how great the country is doing and then you fly back out. So you can see how this, this affects the perception. I think there's also just, um, you know, ch the, the fear of China can be a very useful fundraising device for a lot of different groups. So there's sort of built in incentives that can include everything from the military, obviously wanting to say we have this big threat we have to confront. We need to buy more weapons. There's uh, Congress, you know, lead political leaders that want to blame job losses in their district on, you know, the rise of China rather than um, their own uh, policies. You also have, um, you know, tech uh, firms that, you know, want government funding to train their workforces. So they say, if we don't do that, China is going to eat our lunch. So there's just all these, you know, political factors that I think also help play in and, and hype the rise of China. And just in media, you know, you're going to sell a lot more books or, or get more clicks if you have titles like, you know, when China rules the world, mm -hmm. then, you know, a title like, well, maybe China has some weaknesses and we should pay attention to that. It's just not as, you know, um, gripping, I think, as, as the, the bigger narrative. Thanks for watching that video. To see the full episode, check out the box over here or the link in the description.